is this looking right now? I should have took that back. <laughs> Take me to dinner. I'm not hungry. Yes. Why don't you start working out, moving around? Working out? Yeah. Moving around? I'm fine, thank you. I've had enough. You've had enough ramen. I did cr I did crash mine in front of the house the other day. Jared, thank you, Dazlin. Um, and thank all of you guys, because we wouldn't be able to do this if and no one showed up. Though I would just talk to Dazlin and Jared if that's what everybody was here. And my girlfriend, Angelique, just going to draw quick attention to her. I didn't bring Deuce tonight. Yeah, she wears the hats really well. Um, so my name is Will. Um, I'm really nervous tonight, so I forgot everything that we wanted to talk about, but by the time we get through it all, it'll all come back. So I started my riding career in uh, 2005, um, went to the racetrack for the first time in 2008. Uh, unwillingly, I'll just note, I was peer pressured into the first time I went to a track event um, and the first time I started road racing. So peer pressured into both of those things. I'm glad my friends 
peer pressured me into it though because it has become uh, my sole purpose, my obsession. I eat, sleep, dream. I talk about motorcycles at work. I get in trouble at work for talking about motorcycles. And then some of the best friends I've made uh, in my life are because of motorcycles. And one of them's here tonight, Mr. Jack Baker. Glad you're here to pick everything apart. Um, <laughs> I'm from Vermont originally. Um, I got really into doing stuff like this, you know, organizing and leading uh, motorcycle events and being part of mo motorcycle events in 2007. We started a bike night um, back home in Burlington, Vermont. It's still going on to this day. So we started that in 2007. It's called Vermont Bike Night, surprisingly. Um, while Donnie's Pizza, where we would always meet up on Tuesday nights, is now closed, um, the core group of guys, actually, they, they travel around during the summer and they visit different restaurants along the way um, with group rides and such. So it's really cool that that's still going on. Uh, after, I, after I moved on, it just goes to show um, how great the riding community is, is in Vermont. Um, and really, I mean, I've never been anywhere where you can't say great things about riding communities. So that's why we're all here tonight. Um, let's see, moved to Tucson in 2010. Uh, immediately jumped into being the sport bike program manager at the Muscleman Honda Circuit, which is a small go-kart and supermoto track in Tucson. Um, and it was, I was single, so it was every single weekend and during the week I was at the racetrack for like two and a half years. Um, and then the woman I started dating at the time got really mad at me because I was at the racetrack all the time. And now we have discussions about what vacation means, where vacation is going to the racetrack. And apparently I am wrong. Vacation is going to the beach. <laughs> so it makes for good conversations in relationships. Um, I started, I got my race license in 2011 and uh, started competing uh, in the Southwest, in Arizona and then California. And now after all that, um, I've worked with a bunch of different track day companies. I am a certified coach and instructor through the USMCA, which is the United States Motorcycle Coaching Association. They're a third party certification program. So if you go to the mountains and you want ski instruction, you go to the tennis court, you want tennis instruction, usually your instructors have gone through some sort of vetting and certification program where there's background checks, there's um, emergency protocol for, for medical issues, and then et cetera, et cetera, different levels of how to do that sport. So this U USMCA was founded um, by the former CEO of KTM North America and some of his friends because there wasn't a certification program for teaching people how to ride motorcycles outside of the MSF. And so for the most part, what they found was um, families would go to the dealership and mom, dad, brother, sister would all buy dirt bikes. And then they'd go to the motocross track and there'd be a guy there like, I'm a coach. And they would just give their kids to this coach and without any credentials. And you can kind of surmise how that would go. And more often than not, there were injuries, there were issues, there were lawsuits, etc. So USMCA was born of the dirt bike side of things because there's far more accessibility to riding dirt bikes than there is in, in motocross tracks and there are like road courses and, and pavement tracks and it's a lot easier for families to access. So that they, they have a sport bike program as well. So I'm, uh, I took, I was, I was honored enough to be invited to their inaugural um, like meetings of the minds and then uh, some friends of mine were there, actually, which was cool. So Keith Code, who we'll reference tonight, he was there. Um, and then Chris Ulrich, who is the owner of uh, Team Hammer. And if everybody has heard of the publication Road Racing World Magazine. So they cover uh, racing from MotoGP to, yeah, what's up, brother? Hey, good to see you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, to local racing in the States. So that's that. That's, that's a pretty good intro. I won't, uh, won't chat too much longer about myself. I'll move this chair out of the way.
in essence, we're talking about cornering. So that's a little bit about me. I probably glossed over a bunch of things. Jack's taking notes. Um, so I like to start off our clinics with a, a, like a little, a little quote. Um, oh, <laughs> Nick Nevin. Everyone, Nick Nevin. How you going? <laughs> and his beautiful wife, Tiffany. <laughs> Solid. All right. Um, some quotes and then some definitions. So I thought this one was particularly re relevant both on and off the racetrack. So there is a rule of racing. No race has ever been won in the first corner, but many have been lost there. So that's Garth Stein from his publication, Racing in the Rain. So there's a lot we can gather from that, and we've seen it, if not experienced personally, whether it's on the racetrack during a track day or a competitive event, or if we're on a group ride, that first fast corner when we get into the twisties or we get into the mountains or you know wherever we're going. For me, it was that first intersection onto Main Street where I thought I was going to go fast, right by some people who were wanted to cross the street. I said, well, this will be a cool show for them. And uh, tucked the front, and the bike slid around into the left-hand turn lane and the other side of the road. So I lost the race in the first corner, right? Um, so, and then the topic of uh, this evening, what is a blind decreasing radius late apex corner? And we're going to talk all about different kind of corners that we see on the road, how to identify them a little bit, how to break them down. I'm not going to try to get really nerdy about some stuff. Uh, we're going we're gonna to keep it, try to keep it as light as possible. Um, at the end, we can ask questions, and you guys can ask whatever you want, and we can dive as deep as we want to. Uh, but for the sake of just the discussion right now, we'll try to keep it nice and simple. Um, so jumping into definitions because we've heard some of these things before, but we not, might not necessarily know what they mean. And in fact, I'm still trying to figure out what an apex is. So the definition of apex is the top or highest part of something, especially one forming a point. And we'll come back to that and how it relates to getting around a corner and for us as motorcyclists. Radius, the verb, not the noun, give a rounded form to a corner or an edge. To increase is to become progress progressively greater. To decrease is to make or become smaller or fewer in size. And then camber is the slightly convex or opt arched shape of a road or horizontal surface. And so camber is one of those things that um, we have all experienced on the road. We def def might have not really known what it was but it's very important to how we ride the motorcycle. So before we get into the line and breaking down a corner, how do we steer our motorcycle? Anybody? Counter. What's that? Counter-steering. Counter -steering. Brilliant. Still burns. <laughs> Sometimes with your butt. Sometimes with your butt. <laughs> Keith Code says, and this is predominantly speaking, right? Counter steering is the only way you can direct a motorcycle to steer accurately. Now, we can use our feet, our butt, our head a little bit, and our legs and our knees, but those are all to aid us. The predominant way that we steer the bike is through our handlebars and counter steering. We'll talk about what that is. So counter steering is in fact how you've been steering your motorcycle all the time, whether you know it or not. You cannot steer a motorcycle simply by leaning it. You can get it to veer off course and direction and by leaning your weight off to one side at low speeds, but that's not steering. And what you're doing is you're just causing the front wheel to turn in the direction which you go by leaning off the bike. It's much faster if you just tell it where you want to go with your hands, which are on your handlebars, of course. So that's counter steering. And counter steering happens when we're anywhere from 10 to 15 miles an hour, motorcycle dependent, right? I'm 
so happy we have a whiteboard tonight. So when we are, if this is our motorcycle, it's our rear wheel, and here's our front wheel, and here's our little handlebars, right? In the parking lot, we steer in the direction that we want to go, right? And the reason we do that is because we, there's two things that we're missing. We're missing gyroscopic motion from the wheels and centrifugal force from the crankshaft and the engine spinning. And what those do through this miracle of physics is it keeps the bike upright. And so whenever we've put the, put the motorcycle in neutral and taken our hands off the bars and it continues to stay upright, or if we remember when we were kids, or we still ride bicycles, whether mountain hill or downhill mountain bikes, cycles, if you, you know, we've ridden down the street with our hands off the bars. What keeps our two-wheeled vehicle straight up and down? It's the momentum created by gyroscopic motion of the wheels, which is magic of physics. I'm not a physicist, so I can't explain it more than that. Jack Baker probably can. So we'll say, you know, he's a physicist. 10 to 15 miles an hour below, if we want to turn to the right, we steer the bike to the right. We want to turn to the left, we steer to the left. Now above that is when we get into counter steering. And sorry for people behind me. So just slightly off. That's a good drawing. Right, because that's straight, and that's the front wheel. So to go to the right, we actually turn to the left. And from what I can gather, really, without getting into why the, the science part of it, right, is that at speed, and I had, I had a, uh, one of my first bosses actually explain this to me. So I was riding around the park, parking lot at work, which was at a BMW dealership. And it was around a bunch of brand new BMWs. And I was going faster and faster. It was 20, 30 miles an hour. And every time I went to turn the bike into the next corner, which was just a big loop, it would roll out from underneath me. The front tire would actually, I'd be turning to the right to go right, and it would roll up. And I couldn't understand why. And so Jack De Brule, God bless his heart, used to race Ducatis. He said, no, you've got to counter steer. You have to, you have to open it up a little bit, which when the bike starts to lean, say at 80 miles an hour, we're basically, it's like jackknifing a trailer because the rear wheel is fixed. So if we try to turn to the right at anything over 15, 20 miles an hour, the motorcycle and the gyroscopic motion of the wheels, that momentum is going to say, Mm-mm, no. And it's just going to pick the bike up from underneath you. The motorcycle is at its happiest point when it's straight up and down. Now, once we, using counter steering, we can lean it into a corner and it can be happy down there too. But as soon as, if we just let go in the corner, the bike would naturally pick itself up in a perfect world. Sometimes if you add, or add throttle or add brake, it would keep turning or open up the radius of the corner. But that's counter steering. And from our first clinic on mindfulness, next time we go for a ride, whether it's tonight when we leave, or tomorrow, or this weekend when we go for a, a group ride with our friends, and we say, you know, I don't really counter steer. Now that we've talked about it, I promise you when you get on your motorcycle tonight or this weekend or whenever, you'll go, oh, Keith was right, not Will. Keith was right about counter steering. It is the primary means to accurately steer our motorcycle because when we get into a corner, or we get, we, we, as we get into it, when we get to our entry point and we decide that we want to turn the bike, it is not through any other means than when we turn the handlebars and lay the motorcycle into the corner. So that's counter steering. Figure we should talk about it um, as part of cornering because that's how we get the bike to steer. So, um, the line. So how do we break down a corner? It is comprised of an entry, turning in, getting into the corner. So we're going from a straight line, effectively, or on a highway or on the back roads. It, the road is straight, and then it starts to curve. And the beginning of that curve is where we enter into the corner. When we get to the center, this is where the definition of apex gets a little subjective, but this, 
the, or the slowest part of the corner is usually your apex. And then we have our exit where we're leaving the corner. So we can effectively break a corner down entry, apex, and exit. So that, that's the basis, the foundation of our racing line. And when we're on the street, right, we have to, what are, what are the things that we have to be mindful the most about the line that we take or cornering in general? What's in the corner? Great, great. Now I'm asking, I'm asking leading questions on purpose. I already know the answers of them. Speed. Speed. But what do we find on the road, on the street that we don't have on a racetrack? All these are great, great answers. However, let's, let's draw ourselves a corner. What do they paint? Yeah. And the lines, they're always so inhibiting because I want to cross that yellow all the time because it just feels natural. It feels good. And if we look at our example here, we have a, on, our, on our papers, we do have a center line, and our line for the entry, the apex, and the exit, we find ourselves crossing that line. In a perfect world, and none of us have ever done this, right? No one has ever crossed the yellow line, setting up a corner that we can see through to really get it the right way, right? Entry, apex, exit. That's a terrible drawing. But... <laughs> this is what kind of inhibits us, is that we have a 40-foot or 60-foot or 80-foot piece of road, and we can only ride on half of it. Never mind the fact that there's gravel, there's debris, there's oil, and there's other cars. I don't know, Vegas is crazy. It might be someone laying in the middle of the road out here. Someone's underwear, who knows? And it's narrow. The lane is narrow. You know what I mean, Bill? I do know what you mean, Jack. I mean, it's, it's, it's inhibiting. Why do we pick a line in one lane? Because it's so damn narrow. Which is why when I wrote down, so if we flip our pages over, we can kind of get into the different types of corners that we're going to see. And those all require a little bit of a different way to handle them, right? So a good little saying is, Slow corners, slow. Fast corners, fast. Now, speed is relative on the street based off our motorcycle, our experience, and how silly we are. But we can kind of break corners down into these, into these groupings, right? Where we have a constant radius corner, which is just holding that arc of the corner all the way around. We're not gonna go outside to go inside. Right? We're just going to ride, which is the majority of what we do, because as Jack so masterfully said, the roads and the lanes are narrow. So most of the time, we're just following the radius of the corner. And it tracks a piece of cake compared to the street. <laughs> Amen. Um, an increasing radius, which would be many times also what we call an early apex. A decreasing radius which many times is going to be a late apex corner, which is also the most difficult. And then we're gonna have on all of these, we can have them be on or off camber or positive or negative camber. And I'll draw that on the beautiful whiteboard. And then we have sweepers, double apexes, chicanes, and the hairpin and or switchback. So on our, our mountain roads back east, you get up in the canyons, those are all switchback corners where you come in and the corner turns all the way around and then we go up the mountain. So if anybody's been down to Arizona and ridden up uh, like Mingus Mountain, a lot of great mountain switchbacks, right? So super, super tight, requires a lot of good vision and it requires us mostly to be able to read the road. Just a little subjective, but I think f for me, what I have learned when dealing with a lot of these kinds of corners is 
the road communicates with you, not just how you feel on the motorcycle, but what the lines that are painted on the road. So, oh, thanks, Daslin. So I was driving with my beautiful girlfriend, and we were in a rental car, so I was driving it fast, of course. And we were in Alamogordo, New Mexico, and there's a great little back road there coming down the mountain. And there was a blind crest. Now, how are you supposed to tell where the road goes when you can't see the road at all? Follow the lines. So the white line, you know, it's just, hopefully there's white lines there. Sometimes they're not, but we can cheat a little bit. And this is, again, where mindfulness comes in, where we have good vision. We'll go over some vision stuff here at the end. But looking down the road and seeing, we can see that yellow line in the middle. We can see that center line, or we can see our white lines start to turn before we get over the crest. I was like, well, Will, how do we have that much time if I'm doing 100 miles an hour? Well, you better be looking down the road <laughs> far enough to see it. But that's, that's, our, that's our, our cheat code, right? And we can use those for um, these decreasing radius mountain roads, like if we're out in California, and we're going around. They're usually right-handers, right? And out of our peripheral, keeping that white line or that inside line available to us, and that will tell us, just moments before we get there, if the road's going to continue to tighten or not. And that's really what I found the, the best way to do it when we're talking about riding on the street. Because usually we're going up or down the mountain or through the canyon, and there's that wall of rock next to us. And we're like, I can't see. But sometimes it's invigorating to hustle the bike through there a little bit, maybe go a little bit faster than we should, and then... You know, we, we make it, we come out the other side and we, we push ourselves, we push the bike, we kind of take a chance on maybe the gravel that's in the road and we follow that line around. It keeps hooking to the right and we stay, we, we stay in it, we keep our eyes up, we're having positive throttle, the chassis is flat and then as soon as it picks up and opens up in front of us, we feel good. It's a moment of exhilaration. We're taking a little bit of a risk. But that's how we do it, is we just watch that inside line or that outside line. The road will start to move before we are done traveling through that section of it. And that's, that's the little bit of a cheat code. So if you're ever riding a road that you've never ridden before, slow down a little bit, which we should do anyway, but slow down a little bit and see what the road is telling you. Whether we go out and ride Ortega or Mulholland out in California, or we go up and we ride in Utah or the Pacific Northwest, or we do a coast to coast road trip, listen and watch, pay attention. The road will tell you what it's doing for the most part. Obviously there's some back roads that don't have any lines painted on them. And by then, hopefully, right, we can navigate it a little bit better, identify some of these things. So with a, we'll start with an increasing radius. So generally, the tightest part of the corner is going to be first. So it's going to be old Kenny Roberts said, slow in, fast out. So the biggest mistake that we can make is to charge a corner without knowing, especially when we don't know what's on the other side. So charging a corner is carrying too much speed in the entry part. So slow in, fast out is always, well, don't say always. Uh, yeah, don't chase the <laughs> Unless I'm following you, Jack, hey, and then I'm always chasing. Nobody should be chasing their front end on the street. Which is don't don't outride your vision or the the um, the capabilities of your motorcycle. But um, what was I talking about? Increasing radius corner, slow in, fast out. So you can you're never going to get in trouble if we slow down a little bit more than you think you should, especially in a corner that we're either not sure what it's going to be, you know, if the farm tractors have been out that morning, which you'd know because you can smell the manure, or, right, if it rained the night before out here, sometimes we go up to Pahrump, sometimes, you know, weather over the mountain. Um, slow in, fast out, and that's our increasing radius. So the apex is in the beginning of the corner, and then the corner is going to open up. 
but the decreasing radius is opposite. The entry is going to be faster. There's going to be more room, and we're going to talk about spatial awareness here in a second. There's more room on the entry, and then the corner tightens at the end, which is like the bane of every road racer out there. Figuring out the decreasing radius late apex corner is a, a skill that will take a lifetime to master. Um, even when you think you have it figured out, there's always going to be someone that tucks it up on the inside underneath you that has a little bit more shoots pa than you do, right? And uh, you're like, yeah, how did I do that? I was really nailing this corner. Um, a chicane, right, is going to be a quick right and or left followed by the opposite. So quick left, pick it up and over, quick right, chicane. Um, find a lot of these more back east. Does anybody have a good example of a chicane out here? On the street? I can't really think of one. The drive through Chick fil A right now. Please practice. All right. It would be a decent on ramp one. A little back and forth. Um, a hairpin, we kind of already went over. And usually, hairpins, the fastest, and I'll, I'll explain why we use that kind of language, um, is a late apex corner, but you can take a hairpin and make it a constant radius as well. Um, it's just going to be 180 degrees from the direction that you were traveling to begin with. And then our double apex, which um, are some of the most fun. So double apex or linked corners. And would you get you, you in trouble with highway patrol because you will cross the yellow on a double apex. Right, so outside, turn in and exit. Apex number one and apex number two. Where we come in and we're gonna like fade out and then drive it back out the corner. Oh no, there's our yellow line. And then the semi that's coming to get us. <laughs> so um, the best example of a, a, a double apex for the racetrack around here that most of us would be familiar with is turn 13, which is the bowl aptly named at Chuckwalla Valley Raceway. So it has a apex at the beginning and then you're going to let the bike fade out off the corner, carry your momentum, rotate, get direction, and then as you drive out, because the nature of the exit means you want to be on the outside of the corner, you're going to get tight again and hit the second apex. And no semi at Chuckwalla. Try using the sponge. Oh, thank you. Whoa, wow, amazing. <laughs> it's like she works here. <laughs> so what are we doing for the throttle? With a throttle and a double apex? So... <laughs> Most of the time, right, it's uh, in the middle of the corner. So same, same, same how we, how we do on corner entry, right? So we're either going to use a little bit, of, little bit of brake to set our front end. If you were here last week, we talked about braking and front end stability. Or we're going to roll off the throttle, turn the bike. So that's our entry. Counter steer the bike down into our first apex, which is going to be um, to the inside. And then open the throttle up to flatten the chassis out. And then we just, what we call neutral or positive throttle throughout. Now, again, it's dependent a little bit on bike and then the condition of the road for a double apex. Sometimes you just want to be off the throttle and let the momentum of your entry carry you out. A lot of times it's, it's really how, how we want to do it is we roll in with a little bit of entry speed and then the momentum is going to carry us out. And a lot of times, too, we'll, we'll naturally steer the bike out off that first apex. And then that second one, 
will, once we have direction, the bike will rotate mid corner. You'll get to a point where you're like, well, the corner, the, my second apex is down there and my front wheel is pointing this way. So we want to make sure that I don't add throttle until my, th my wheel is pointed in the direction that I want to go. Fairly simple process, really hard for some of us to apply. We start adding throttle before the front wheel is pointed the direction we want to go. And lo and behold, the direction that is pointing when we add throttle is the direction the motorcycle goes. <laughs> Unreal. So we want to wait, make sure for a double apex that when we get in, we let the bike rotate or turn mid corner at that, at that farthest point, like at the top of the parabola or the arc of the corner before we drive it out for that second apex. Um, Double apexes on the street, not really a thing. Correct me if I'm wrong. I agree. Not really a thing, not something we should be doing, but it is something that we find on the track quite a bit. And they are very enjoyable because that carrying that mid corner speed for the bike to push out and then being able to drive out of a corner like that is a lot of fun. Um, so the on and off camber positive and negative. So sticking with the racetrack, if this is our curbing, we're going to pick the corner and we're going to look right at it and we're going to cut it in half. Okay. So this is our curb. This is actually turn nine at Chuck Walla. If anybody wanted to know, this is negative camber. Can someone read us our camber definition again for me right quick? Thank you, sir. So convex or curved nature, and that can go both ways. I think it was concave and convex. I didn't pay attention in science class. So when the road effectively goes away from you in the corner. So this is the curbing in turn nine, and we'll say this is our apex cone as well. Here's our knee, our little knee puck. There's our foot. And here is the tire, bow, 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 bow. look at that tread, I'm running DOTs. So the closer to the curbing, the more positive camber we have, or it's safer. The farther out we get, the less camber that we have, which effectively means the less pavement the tire has to grip. So negative camber corners can bite us in the butt pretty bad because all of a sudden you're straight up and down, you're going up the mountain pass, everything's fine, and then you're on your ass. Because we're not, we, weren't, we weren't being mindful of the road, maybe we just got caught up in the flow, we were looking at the trees, we were reflecting on how beautiful the day was, or we were thinking about dinner that night, things that we think about, right? And we lost a little bit of our situational awareness, or our SA, on the road, and we ran into a corner and we didn't see that it fell away from us. Most engineers in the world today do not design our roads that we ride on. In the desert, though, you have to have that camera. Right. In Nevada, especially. And, yep. But not a huge problem, though it is out there. So negative camera. That's another reason. Don't tell me what to do, Dad. You do it anyway. I just, Jack, I just follow you, man. So anybody that didn't know, this is turn 13 at Chukwa. This is the bowl. So this is, uh, in theory, this is 10 degrees banking, or what we call positive. Why did I write, why did I do it like that, negative and positive? Like, we all know what a plus sign means. Unreal. So when we're in the corner, right, we're leaning in again. A little feet. Here's our tire. We have different, this is a different kind of tire, right? We have a lot of positive camber to the road, which is positive traction. So really, you can just send it in there as hard as you want, and the road's going to be there. there the tire's never going to run out of pavement. So positive 
our negative camber corner, we're going to run out of pavement the further away we get on it. And, we'll, and we can feel that. There's this uneasy feeling in our stomach. The, the bike feels light underneath us and isn't really reacting to our turn uh, or our counter steer as much. We're kind of like, Bleh. in a sense, sometimes it even feels like what cold tires first thing in the morning on a January day feels like, right? We're at a positive camber. It's just like grip for days and you feel like you can conquer the entire world in that one section of the road. Um, so that's positive and negative camber and those can be applied to any one of our corners. So increasing, decreasing, chicane, hairpin, uh, sweeper, or double apex. And are there a lot of, is there a lot of weird stuff out there these days that aren't on the list? Yeah, I don't have roundabouts on the list. <laughs> I'm glad you guys all laughed. I think <laughs> now I, I, I will say this. I will say this about roundabouts. When they first built that one up on the mountain. Oh, that messed the oh, <laughs> Lord. You see a lot of tire marks up there. Thankfully when I when I went up and rode it, um, they were still building it. So I'm like, oh, they're building a roundabout here. I'm like, yeah. This is great. I'll be able, it's on a nice long straight piece, right? And you can like a little chicane through here. I'll be able to haul ass through this thing. And they got done building it. And again, paying attention to the road. When we rolled up on it, we're like, oh, the pavements are different colors. Okay, indication one, that something might not be as good as we wanted it to be. And number two, when I got in there, it was like riding on ice. I, I went in to, to quick flick the bike over and it just went, yeet. And I said, of course you guys would build it so it wouldn't have any traction. Mm -hmm. Terrible. <laughs> so. Yeah. Coming out of it, lost traction on the rear. That's tough. They do bite back sometimes. So. On that note, a couple of things again. For corners, cornering basics. Take slow corners slow, fast corners can be taken fast. So don't try to make a slow corner a fast corner like I did, trying to show off for people that I didn't even know in the middle of a city, right? A 90, 90 degree corner is a slow corner. Treat it with respect. Slow in, fast out. If we don't know, we can slow down a little bit more. Don't charge the corner, right? And what's slowing down the entry will allow us to get our line right, get our apex, and then we can have a nice steady open throttle on the drive out. And then lastly, the most important thing is look where you want to go, right? So we look through the corner. So having good situa situational awareness, good spatial awareness, reading the road, having mindfulness, knowing what we're doing on the motorcycle, not bebopping Taylor Swift, right? <laughs> I love Taylor Swift when I'm on my road glide or on your road glide because I don't have one. Can I use your story, PK? So right to that point, everyone's, well, how many people aren't familiar with Mulholland Drive in, up in Malibu? All right. So also, also called the snake, right? The snake. So great twisty road, the hills and the canyons up above north of Malibu and in uh, LA. And there's one corner where this, people have made this man famous. So there's a photographer and a, video, a videographer, his name's Arnicky. And there's this one corner, super tight. How would you describe that corner based off of what we talked about tonight? Yeah, and, and the dip. Got the dip in it too. It's just basically and marbles. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and you got the road edge. So basically, anything you could imagine that you're gonna do, if you if you do something stupid in there, you're gonna pay for it. Yep. If you don't, the what what I was explaining earlier when we went through there, we were with a, with a group of people that had never been up there before, and we said, number one, this is commitment. 
when you get there, you're gonna see this big, huge yellow arrow, this sign with the yellow arrow, and when you're there, you better have your head whipped around, look through this damn turn, and stay steady. Once you commit, stay committed. Chop the throttle, touch the brake, grab the clutch, anything like that, you're gonna unsettle, and more than likely, you're gonna either be off camber or you're gonna hit that dip. And when you do, you unsettle, and that's where our Nikki has his photos, is when people unsettle at that point right there, and all hell breaks loose. So looking where you wanna go, right? Told his friend to look, well, told the whole group, look through the corner, and then famously, it's captured on video for all time, his friend Mark started to turn his head and look at the guardrail. And what do you think happened? <laughs> now, our survival reactions, right, before he didn't just look at the guardrail and then ride right into it, he looked at it and the bike picked up off the corner. And then our survival reactions, right, so we either chop the throttle or we grab the brake, right? Rolled off, the bike lost traction, and he slid underneath the guardrail. He ended up being okay, yeah? Just embarrassed. Got up and, went like this. Yeah. <laughs> and you can go find it on YouTube. Like it's, I've seen it. I'm yeah, sure a, <laughs> a couple of us have seen it. But vision, vision is the most important part of cornering. If we're talking about the basis of cornering, it's good to know, okay, okay, Will, like this kind of corner versus this kind of corner, going up, going down, momentum, camber, cool. But if we're not using our eyes, right? When it comes to riding a motorcycle, vision is the master key. Let's see what Keith has to say about it. Oh, we're going to do a drill too. I forgot about that. Uh, while riding, every decision you make is governed by the amount of space that you have. Think that you have or feel that you have or believe that you have. Look over any riding action you care to, and this is true for all. The two basic functions, speed and direction changes, of a motorcycle are totally dependent on the amount of space you have to do either of them. Unlike most of the standard riding procedures we have investigated, this one has no mechanical gadgets to assist us. So that being said, spatial awareness, vision, how do the fastest motorcycle racers and the fastest car drivers in the world go fast? It's not their equipment, right? It's not, it's not how they do things on the bike. It's all starts here. So um, when, when and if you guys take uh, California Superbike School, which I would recommend for everybody, it's a great course. In level two, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna reveal some information. In level two, they talk about vision, and they attached, um, I want to say they, somebody, attached a, uh, an optical little uh, recognizer fancy doohickey to the rider's eyes, and they've done this with F1 drivers too, to see how, how do they look at the racetrack, all right? And we'll, we'll try to do a little, uh, a little something something here for a, for a drill, but basically, what they do is they watch the guy's eyes, and as they're going through the corner, it's little plus signs all the way in. So if this is our entry point and this is our apex, right? As the rider gets down, his vision is always, well, her vision, your vision is always going to be as far in front of you as we can get it. So on the street especially, eyes down the road, but it's not just down the road. We have to worry about peripherals too. On the racetrack, we don't really have to use this too much. There's certain places where we do to let us know that, oh, we're gonna go up the racetrack, we're, you know? But on the street though, we have to pay way more attention peripherally and straight down the road. And that's a funny story. I remember, I wanted to tell you guys another story. Um, I admit I had been drinking. And then my friend said, hey, you want to take my motorcycle for a ride? And I was like, oh, a Honda CBR 954 RR? Those things are awesome. Yeah, I'd love to take your motorcycle for a ride. I wasn't too inebriated, right? It wasn't a crazy night, but I had, you know, had a couple beers and I was slightly impaired. I probably would have got a DUI, a cup, you know. We don't have to talk about that. But as I was riding, I found myself, right? 
It's fine. It was years ago. It was years ago. It's, Mom, it's fine. Still here. <laughs> Love me. But what I found myself doing, right, in my slightly impaired state was I was staring right at the ground. Right in front of me, two to five feet in front of me, and the bike would not stop turning. It was constantly left, right, left, right, left. And I was like, what is going on? Like, I can ride a motorcycle. I'm proficient at this. Never mind, right, that I had a couple beers. And what I found in that moment, and uh, I think Keith tells a story like this in his book as well, um, and this is related to alcohol as well, except he was hungover the next day riding his motorcycle. But in that moment, right, we pick our eyes up, and all of a sudden, the motorcycle stabilizes. Because when we're staring either in the car or on the bike, we're staring right in front of us. Our mind has no time to take in any of the information that you're consciously or subconsciously seeing and processing. And it's, whether you want to or not, it's telling your body to make adjustments for what it sees. Oh, pothole, oh, crack, oh, there's a rock there, like, oh. When we pick our eyes up, all of a sudden our mind relaxes, and so does our heart rate and our body, and we're not tense on the bike. When we're tense on the bike, the bike has a tendency to not do what we want it to do, right? Because we're telling it not to do naturally what the motorcycle wants. Like the motorcycle physics, again, has certain tendencies that it wants to do when we're tense, when we're grabbing the bike so hard that our knuckles are white. It doesn't, we were not allowing it to track over the road surface and it's not an integrated dance between us and our equipment and our machine. So this is something that I wrote up um, for actually one of my guys in 2019 when we went to Laguna. Um, Justin had never been there before. And so to kind of talk more about vision and what we can do in preparation to go race at Laguna Seca in Monterey, which is a very famous racetrack, we need to work on our awareness a little bit. So I wrote this. Spatial awareness, the definition of your ability to be aware of objects in space and your body's position in relation to them, right? So where we are at, where we want to be, and how are we going to get there is based off of what we can see. Vision is our main sensory input while riding. It's used to identify concrete points of reference specifically related to entering and exiting a corner or navigating a busy section of road or scanning an intersection in the city. Understanding our awareness of the space that we are physically taking up and the space that is available to utilize allows us to recognize the most effective, efficient, and safe manner to operate our motorcycle out in the world. The more we see, the more time we give our mind to, ba to make both conscious and subconscious decisions that allow us to get from the house to work, from the gas station to a restaurant, or wherever we're going on the motorcycle. So making sure, right, if we go back to two weeks ago when we talked about mindfulness, where are we in the world? What are we seeing? What are we feeling? Where are we on the bike? Where are we putting the motorcycle to set ourselves up for that corner? How are we reading the road? How are we listening to what, every, like, uh, what the road is, is saying back to us? Cracks, bumps, rocks, right? Are we engaged in what the activity that we're doing, right? Was, when we're on the motorcycle, we need to be engaged with riding the motorcycle. And all of that relates to identifying our entry, our apex, and our exit getting through the corner, looking to where we want to go, and getting through the ride, the corner, the section of road successfully. Questions? You said something that you know, really made me think about something I've been struggling with since I've been riding. You know, I do a lot of group riding, and uh, when we hit, you know, twisty, um, you know, you talk about setting, you know, breaking the beginning of the curve to set, you know, your bike, and then heading to the curve. Sometimes people get really upset if they see a brake light in a curve. So I think I've developed a bad habit of like ending 
brake or slowing the bike down before going to the curb. And, then, and I'm not sure that, I don't think that's right. I mean, nobody's ever taught me how to do this, but I'm, could you talk about, could you very briefly, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, so kind of like what we talked about, talked about last week a little bit, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so well, like, let's talk about uh, really like the impetus first of why you've developed this habit. Why would people get upset during a group ride if they see brake lights? Anybody? Well, I think you don't think you know what you're doing. Or well, they're too close. Psychologically, the way it works. So yeah, they you think it's like that. People are aggravated. <laughs> And uh, it's funny that you say that because I remember one of my, one of the first group rides I went on um, was through a, a pretty dynamic road in Vermont going up to an even more dynamic road. So it was a bunch of ups and downs and arounds, right? And right, visually when we can't see, survival reaction, conscious or unconscious, we're going to grab the brake. That's the first thing we do. We roll off the throttle and we grab the brake. And so... Um, we got to the, we got halfway through the ride and we stopped before going up the mountain, and some of the guys that we were with were a little bit outspoken, and they were yelling at the lead rider like, "Hey man, like why are you slowing down so much? Like why are you on the brakes so much?" We're actually like he was probably doing now in hindsight doing the right thing, but um, I think group rides through twisties um, within your group. And I mean, this is how we do it. The, the guys that were the, or the gals that were the most comfortable and wanted to carry the most speed went first. Um, but as far as getting upset with seeing brake lights and tell people to suck it up, like, that's how it's. So the right way, and again, everything that we've talked about thus far has been pretty subjective, other than like the mindfulness stuff, which is I just stole a bunch of information from people. And then utilize it in my own experience, but um, we have the most control while turning into a corner, both in a car um, and on a motorcycle, when we utilize the brakes. So trail braking. So when we, on entry, right? Oh, don't run out on me, marker. So we've got Throttle and brake are usually, all right, so braking and throttle. So our brake pressure is increasing as our throttle is decreasing. And we have a braking zone if we're just talking about closed course. And we can, we can apply these same, so this is 300 feet. So we usually have cones on a racetrack, so 300, 200, 100, and we'll just say our, uh, say our turn in point is at 150. So our, we're braking all the way through here, and then to the apex is where we do our trail braking, which is going to be the same inverse except with traction instead of brake pressure. So now we change and we call this traction. And that's available traction, right? Not 100% correct. Nick Einosh would probably disagree with me, huh, Jack? Well, if anybody is bitching about a big brake light, you know they have a well, besides the subjective part of it. <laughs> okay. You're going smoothly through so one of the biggest problems is riding in, in, a, in a formation. That's difficult to do. It's experts only. You think you're a newbie to ride a formation? Well, we always want to, you know, where we go staggered, we go into a corner, yeah, right? Yeah. You want a straight line. So if anybody's that close to you, they, there's something wrong with that. That they're worried about your brake light. You know what I mean? I, I think. I mean, it's never really bothered me by the reactor, you're slowing down anyway, so how could it be a bad thing? You no, know, and that's another interesting thing about the, the engine brakes is that, and I, I was noticing when I was reporting, because after last week I was trying to pay attention to what I'm doing, and I use my engine brakes a lot. 
Sure. And but the problem with that is that I'm giving no indication that's far behind me to be able to behind me what I'm doing. That's why there's a bunch of neat electronic stuff available now. It's flashes and it has you know the geometers or whatever, right? You can yeah. uh, like, Jack, what if I'm riding a bike that's as old as you? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky. I agree. I agree. That is a quality vintage right there. But to, to go back to answering your corner, right? Or your question. We have the most, so this is where our most of our braking is done, is set our speed right for a corner. And then we go from, as we turn in, say we're going from, it's a slope corner, so we're going from 80% at our max braking to 0% by the time we get to the center of the corner. And that was with uh, trailing off the brakes, right? Or a constant reduction of pressure from our initial, Shannon, where are our, the big stack goes. You had one of the breaking ones in there. Uh, that one was just so you'd have me buy one off of it. Right. I was going to read the trail breaking. Oh, you know, should. though, if somebody actually does comment you and, and actually play that you were breaking, you can explain to them that it's very difficult to trail break unless you're breaking. Yeah, well, trail breaking is an advanced technique. And for years and years and years, you hit the brakes on the straightaway, you let off, and went into the corner. I mean, that was the way to do it for years. And there's nothing wrong with that because it makes you smooth. But trail braking, with tires down that we have, you can get a lot more brake pressure and you can get a lot more stop in that turn into the apex. It's an advanced technique. It's an advanced technique that works very, very well. Absolutely. Um, it can be used both on and off the racetrack. It gives us more positive control of the motorcycle when we have a little bit. Um, we're talking like 0 to 20, 0 to 30%. So, when we come to an intersection, right, and just like dad, uncle, or grandpa, or even mom taught us, is when we, we step on the brakes, right, as we approach the intersection, say it's a red light. As we approach the red light, we do most of our hard initial braking before we, we don't just put the brakes on and then ride it all the way to a stop and whoop, we start to decrease our brake pressure by the time we get to the intersection. And then we try to just get that little to stop the truck or the car or the van. It's soft. That's trailing. It's a reduction of pressure on the brakes to a given speed or a given stopping distance. So on the racetrack, we don't talk about slowing down. We shouldn't. Um, some people do. Because we don't... We, it's not, we want to go fast. We don't want to go slow. Being on the track is performance driven. So it's about setting your speed. And we can do that on, on the street too. When we go into a corner, we don't want to come to a stop. We want to set our speed for any given corner. And for those of us that are comfortable on a certain section of road, that speed is going to be a little bit higher. Um, and if we're on a, like a new section of the road, we're on a group ride, and we haven't, and none of us have been there before. Like, I want to see a bunch of brake lights. That means that everybody that's in front of me, including the group the leader, is having positive control of their motorcycle. And we're using the brakes to affect our turning performance, right, which decreases our trail, gives us a little bit more uh, turnability of the bike. And then once we have control and we set our speed for the corner, we gently let off the brakes. And so that's, that's effectively, I would say, the best way to do it, especially with our modern motorcycles today. Um, all the things that happen, whether we have ABS or a linked brake setup, or you know, we grab the front and the rear goes, or we use the rear and the front goes. Or you see that Daslin's case, he just uses the rear too much. That's what I told you. See, now I, I tell you these things in confidence. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't tell. We don't tell. <laughs> I praise you. I, I said, <laughs> forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I used my rear brake, my foot brake, too much in the corner. Hey, that's okay. What does using the rear brake in the corner do? Preloads the front, it, drops the back down. Whatever it does, it feels good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it feels really good. It, it feels kind of safe. It flattens the chassis out a little bit. It feels safe. So, um, for an official uh, trail braking definition, the action of trailing off or tapering off the brake lever pressure and braking force as a rider enters the corner. Which effectively 
you can get the same desired result through engine braking, right? Which is just rolling off the throttle. However, unless you have your tuner on the back with his laptop plugged into your ECU, and for every corner, he's adjusting your engine braking for you, we don't have control of that. So it can become, maybe not a bad habit, but it can become a little bit of a crutch. Where we get in certain situations where we need to know, we need to know what we're doing here. I use two fingers predominantly, right? Whatever we use for our fingers. But if we rely most of the time on the engine braking to slow us down, especially if we're on, uh, <coughs> we have a really short gearing or we're on a big combustion bike with the big E-twins, we roll off, right? I'm in control. I'm in control of setting my speed. The motorcycle is not. That's why it's one of the biggest things is, um, that we talk about on the track again is that your fast riders are gearing their motorcycles and tuning their motorcycles to eliminate as much engine braking as possible because we're in control. We want that bike to roll. We want that energy and that momentum because once you over brake for a corner, Getting that momentum back, getting that energy back, is twice as hard. Especially in a car. Especially in a car. Now, Will, I'm trying to remember last week, did you talk about how there is a difference in traction when you are setting your bike with the front brake? And if so, how would that be replaced if you were only doing engine brake? So, we get, um, thank you, Jared. So, when we go to the front brake, right, our suspension compresses. And then our, when we load the tire, and so like uh, like our great rider coach uh, Nick Ionash says, load the load the tire before you work the tire. We might have heard that quite a bit in the past, but basically what we're doing is, and I was taught, um, set your front end. So when your suspension is all the way out, right, it's at the top of the stroke. We use a, an upside down fork from the USD. Anybody ever wanted to know what that meant? Stands for upside down. It took me a long time to figure that out, just so everyone else. I'm like, oh yeah, USB forks. Those are the hottest. That's it. What's it stand for? Upside down. Oh, well, that makes sense because the stanchions at the bottom. Oh, I'm an idiot. So, most modern sport bikes these days, right? And if we look at, say, like a Ninja 300, it's the other way. So, all it is is the inner fork tube and the outer fork tube are reversed. This is where our axle works, right? So, same, same. It's just easier to describe on one of these guys. So, we could call this the top of your suspension stroke, and then as we compress it, as we get on the brakes, it comes down. And where your optimal, and Bobby, correct me if I'm wrong, since you're the guy, our optimal performance where we want to be, and why we bring our stuff to Bobby every year, and our suspension rebuilt, is in the middle of the stroke. So when we come off the brakes, we're not on the bottom anymore. So here's the top, here's the bottom, and then the middle. Hard braking is gonna put, put us on the bottom of the stroke. So setting our suspension and loading our tire is going to give us more positive feedback from the motorcycle. It's gonna give us more positive control. It's gonna stick us to the road. That front tire is going to, instead of being right here on the road, right? It's going to be, I'm going to draw this terribly, it's going to be squish. <laughs> it's going to squish a little bit. That's highly magnified. Right? But that's essentially what's happening, right? Is that tire is deflecting, it's deforming on the pavement. It's giving you that good positive contact patch that we want. And then what gives us turning performance from using trail braking or using the brakes as we turn the bike in is rake and trail. So it's a reduction in trail, which a shorter wheelbase turns better. So on our, on a lot of stuff out here, on our big choppas, our custom choppas, right, we're all raked out. Super long rake, right? There's no turning performance. I worked with one of those last weekend, and the guy followed me everywhere and never got by. And I wasn't going slow. <laughs> I'm not trying to profile anybody. <laughs> <laughs>
Right, so that's raked out. Not a lot. Really, really long rake. Really, really long trail. Way out here. So if we wanted this bike to turn better, right, or get on the brakes, and effectively what? Shortening our wheelbase by compressing our suspension, it's going to move us back a little bit. And it's going to take that trail number and increase it a little, or decrease it a little bit. And so what we find is, next, if you guys haven't experienced this, um, you're, you know, the bike will get, uh, so I gotta get a little bit twitchy sometimes. We're hard on the brakes and we're trying to turn. It'll, <laughs> might give us a little jerky, especially our sport bike riders, right? Because our wheelbase is a little bit too short. Or we can go too far. We're basically, we're trying to take the front wheel and push it up underneath our ass, which is too much trip. Um, but modern sport bikes, cruisers, and adventure bikes are designed that when we do get on the brakes and we compress the front end and we decrease that trail, they are designed that way to give us more things so that it doesn't get twitchy. So they're a little bit long on purpose, which is why if anybody's into like MotoGP or World Superbike, you'll hear about custom triple trees and head angle and rake and trail because they will want better performance of turning on the track versus the street where we want more stability. Very good question. Thank you. And then, did I answer that okay? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Jared, no, 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 no. <laughs> what else? What else we got? Come on, Iris. You need to speak up. So, so when you're on track and you hit the corner, um, you, you apply more. Front brake and back brake, right? Yes. So and that changes the um, perpetual motion of the motorcycle. We're almost like a little sideways. So if you're going into the corner, all the, the you see a lot. You see a lot on the commercials and stuff like that. And you're racing work. The bike is coming up on the end. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. And it, it's like. Pushing it, and does that ha have to do with that counter steer? Say that again. Does that have to do with the counter steer that, that you're talking about? So, when we really, really get after it, so um, the best example of that is uh, and apologies for anybody that doesn't doesn't know MotoGP right. So Mark Marquez versus Jorge Lorenzo. So Mark is all about max performance all the time. Young rider, I don't know, trying to beat Valentino Rossi's world, world record, championship record. But he would, he always over gene the bike. So it takes one times the force of gravity to get the rear end off the ground. And then same for the front. So when we overwhelm that, when we get into like 1.2 or 1.3 Gs of force, the rear end is coming off. And then, Jack can probably do it. I don't, I really, I don't have that cognizance where I can feel the front start to push. Um, but that's essentially what they're doing is they're getting that front tire to push a little bit and they're still counter steering the motorcycle uh, to, to get it to turn. But then they're also, when the bike starts to slide like that, they're turning it the other way too. So they're counteracting the slide at that, you know, at ten, five to 10% of being out of control. It's the same way that like flat track, so many watches like flat track racing, so dirt track guys, right? They pitch into the corner and they throw that wheel all the way sideways and they get it leaned over down and they got their foot on the ground and then all they're doing is using the throttle to steer and then they're managing that front traction in the direction they want to go by turning the front wheel in or out. They've got that big, what was that, 18 inch, 17 inch, 30? How big are the flat tracks up now? They're 19s. Okay, thank you. So big 19 inch front wheel gives you, rear too, it's 19. It gives you more surface area, gives you more tire, gives you more ability to, to turn and move the bike. So um, what you'll see a lot is a rear brake these days for most riders, uh, performance riders is kind of a personal preference thing. Um, it, what it actually does is it helps to keep the chassis flat. So you see that a lot in rain, rain races to 
continue um, performance on corner entry instead of using a lot of front brake and overwhelming the front tire because things get a little bit slippery in the rain what a rider will do is get all of their braking done almost straight up and down and then as they trail off the front they will use the rear brake to continue to slow down because when we get on the throttle because of it's a mechanical it's what we call mechanical anti squat so the position of your counter shaft sprocket, the little one, versus your swing arm pivot, right, are just slightly offset. So when you get on the throttle, and if you've ever watched a bike on a dyno, you'll watch it when they go back to the gas, <coughs> the, the rear of the bike will actually lift up. So when we say squat on acceleration, that's a car thing. That's not a bike thing. It's when chain we, torque. When we, get on, when we get on the throttle on a motorcycle, out of a corner, or from a, from a stoplight or anything, what you're feeling sit down is you on the motorcycle, not the actual bike. The actual bike is picking up a little bit. Now, the opposite happens when we get on the rear brake. It's going to sit down. So when we're going into a corner, we're like, you're like, oh, I'm not going to make it. We, we charge the corner. We go in a little bit hot. And we might set the front and over brake. And now the bike doesn't want to steer too much. If we use the rear brake in conjunction with that, it'll actually flatten the chassis out. And then you give us the turn. Yes! That's the <laughs> No forgiveness required. Is that yeah. cool? What else we got? Like, you can blame Freddie Spencer for that whole rear brake. <laughs> He's the one who started not using the rear brake. Well, then they asked Kevin Schwantz about it, too. He and, used and, he, and he was like, I need just to use the front. Eh, you know what? I think that's belonging. But we Kevin also so said long. racing is 90% between the years, too. Of course, if not more. Huh? And I like that. <clears throat> but it does. It does, especially in rain races. I mean, I'm a, I, you race a lot in the rain, yeah? I have. The biggest thing, the biggest thing out here too, right? When it starts to rain, is well, we all know this, and if we don't, it gets really slippery, um, really, really quick. So, add time, right? We're talking about spatial awareness and where our vision is. Like, add time to anything that we do uh, when it starts to rain out here. Those two days a year, um, sooner, softer on the front. And if you don't use the rear predominantly, like I really don't use it that much. I use it more, a lot more now, especially on the street, than I ever have. It's because it's, it gives me more control, but I like to slide the rear out, so I'm not as a little bit on the rear end. It is fun. Um, but also, it just gives us more control of the bike, especially when you get in adverse conditions. So if it's cold, if it's rainy, uh, windy, foggy, you can't see, whatever. It gives us just a little bit of added added support and added confidence. And if you do lock the wheel, you lose all that centrifugal force or gyroscopic push in the wheel. Well, if you lock, so locking up the rear, we have to be careful because it's fun when we're sliding. <laughs> but when, if we don't manage that trail braking of the rear, right? So we have a lot of, right, a lot of rear bendings here. Then we've got these things down here, and it's either on or off. I can't feel anything through my boots, right? So we're like, slam on the rear brake. We're like, ah, I lost traction. Lost some traction is bad. What do I do? Let go, I let go, and then it goes whoop. Because on my motorcycle, well, first off, the wheels want to be in line with one another. They don't like it when they're not lined up. They, they come together. But also, when that rear slides and then regains traction, famous high side that you see on the racetracks where your ass on the tea kettle through the air, blue, green, blue, green, like Ricky Bobby. And, but when that traction regains, if we're, if we're not careful about where and how we let off that rear brake, and if you play with it enough, you'll figure out, you'll figure out that sweet spot where you can slide the bike and then let off the brake and have it regain and not try to pluck the other seat. So, you know, for those people that are not on the track that are just well, we're riding on the street. How do we safely try to increase our skill on the corner? Because if you push it too much, then you've gone too far, and then you run into problems. How do we safely get there so that we're increasing our confidence level on those corners? Come to the racetrack. <laughs> so our local track day company, Apex Assassins, which 
Nick is here representing for us. Um, we do a program called Taste of the Track, so you guys can come out and get a little, like this, a little clinic, a little seminar, a little back and forth with, with some instructors, and then we go up and we put you on the track. Um, but for those of us... Huh? It was a blast. Yeah, you did really good too. I, no, I was she terrible. Was but it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, she made it cool. <laughs> Matt Cooper said I missed every apex. I don't miss any of these I was in station five. Oh, oh. And, you know, that little corner over there. You did just fine. I did great. But how do we increase our performance on the street? Again, that's a subjective question. I'm going to get a lot of people yelling at me. But, um, Someone was going to say, I just forgot. Where's a good place to practice? But how can we do it on the street? The safest place to practice is in a parking lot. Yeah, it's a parking lot. Help me out, DJ. One of the things I do with a lot of new riders that want to want to get better at cornering and controls and back, et cetera. And let me just preface this and say that it is not a damn racetrack. But think about it. If you go out to Red Rock to a loop and go in the loop, you don't have two way traffic. You can follow your lines and create your lines. Yes, for the reservation. Yes, you do. So what I'm saying is true. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, take a lot of, I take a lot of new riders, and I have them follow me through and follow my line through and show them you know, how, to, how to apex, how to enter exit, and so on and so forth through there. And then one of the things I do with them, you know, I say, hey, you can practice here as much as you want. One of the things we work on is going into Red Rock and being able to ride through Red Rock and not grab your brakes. So you're controlling your entry speed, your exit speed, your apex, so on and so forth and being smooth through there. And because there's so many different angles and types of turns and everything else in there, it, it, you know, I do it all the time still. You know, I've been running for years, but I, I do it every time, every chance I get. And then now that I got to a little piece back up, I go out there, go out there and play with that. You know, it's just, you know, it's just, it's just a matter, it's a place to practice. To, you know, and you don't have to be flying through there. If you're at 35 miles an hour, you know, 25 miles an hour, you can still have fun in there. You know, and actually work, work your lines, work your angles, and you don't have all these other distractions. Other than when it freshly rains, you know, you're going to have your you're gonna have issues there. But that's that's one of the places I go to, you know, just to work on. I call my skill drill. Just go out there nice. and just, you know, back and forth, back and forth, go through it. Have a little fun, you know, and work, work your angles. Another thing I would, I would add to that, too, and I think a, a lot of us feel like the only way we can learn to get better on a motorcycle is just by putting miles. Well, if we're doing that without instruction or guidance, we can develop bad habits. We can develop habits that we, that we don't know that are improper. Um, and so, one of the biggest things, and you can do, uh, it's <clears throat> kind of brain fart for a second. So I got twist of the wrist and twist of the wrist too, which are, I mean, for all, all intents and purposes, sort of like, the two best pieces of reading material that any of us can read. Um, and then they made a great video, a great movie about just the rest two with some terrible actors. Um, but um, so Keith Cohn uh, has written so much on what it is and how we ride on So we can do a lot off the bike to educate ourselves. I mean, all of you guys being here tonight is just proof of your desire of wanting to learn a little bit you know, even if you, I mean, Jack's been riding and racing longer than I've been alive. And he, well, for a lot of he might, he, he might have learned something tonight, but, you know, we all have something to learn. Constantly. Like, the beauty of this, and I think I expressed this uh, during our mindfulness um, one, two weeks ago, was there's no ceiling. Like, we're all different sizes, different races, different genders. We all have different aptitudes, what we do for work, what we do outside of work, athleticism, right? I suck at math. And, but there, none of that matters when it comes to riding a motorcycle. We can all learn to be better, faster, safer. We can all increase our skill and our knowledge of what the bike is doing underneath us, what we're doing on the motorcycle. And one big, big thing, um, through doing stuff like this, my mentors, my trainers, and then now doing the seminar with you guys, and then also doing stuff with my students, and with my guys on, on our race team. Uh, my good friend, uh, Ty Bankford, um, I went over to his house in Escondido, and 
a year and a half ago. Um, and we did some off track rider training. And I broke out Twist of the Rich Run and we talked about thought practical and talked about corners and setups and a lot of the stuff that we discussed tonight. And then we talked about mentality. And specifically relating to the racetrack, but it's all it's all the same. The focus, the awareness, the mindfulness that we apply to riding motorcycles on or off the track, it doesn't matter, makes us better human beings. It increases our relationships with our loved ones, it increases our friendships with each other. Because we share this beautiful experience of being riders, right? It makes us more close than we are with some of our family. Right? Ultimately, what it does is it challenges us to increase our awareness, both externally and internally. It creates better self-awareness. It teaches us conflict resolution. It teaches how to deal with difficult people in frustrating situations. At least, it can. And so Ty hit me up and he said, man, not only is you know what we talked about affecting my riding, he's like, dude, like, Calmer at work and more relaxed. Like he, you know, he was talking about some relationships that he had. It's like I'm more relaxed in my relationships. And I just wanted to thank you for, you know, what we talked about. It's it's overflowing from this motorcycle thing into the rest of my life, and so pretty incredible stuff. But off, yeah, he's off goofy, the so if that helps, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> but off the motorcycle, what, what can we do to increase our our performance on the bike? Off the, off the bike stuff. Um, and that stuff, um, if you guys want to want to hit me up, if you want to set up an appointment, we can either be at Starbucks, you can come over to the house, you can hang out in the garage, whatever. I do uh, I do off-track construction and off-the-bike construction as well. I'm available for that. So um, get in the books, do some research. There's a lot of great material out there. Um, I almost, who has read The Pace by Nick Iron? published in 92 in motorcycles. Something I would encourage everybody to look up. It's just a quick, it's a quick read, and it really just kind of talks about what the last three weeks have been about. So group riding, corner entry, speed on the speed on the road, how to set up, how to set yourself up for success, being safe, all coming back at the end of the ride, and a bunch of other things. It's a great article. Um, and I think he wrote a follow-up too because some things have changed. Um, Technology-wise and technique-wise, some of the breaking discussions that he has, and he wrote a follow-up piece to that as well. But yeah, off, off bike training. Will you uh, say a few words about denial? Yes, at the end. <laughs> Should or when is there a better time to, like, on a sport bike? Is what I write, but to be further up on the, the seat or. Back in the seat, leaning more, gripping the tank in a in a corner. When or you know what I mean? What I'm trying to ask here. Yeah. At what point in the turn should we be more forward in the seat? Kind of like kind of relating it to dirt bikes, obviously. In a in a corner, you lean more towards the front. Yeah, I so got you. You're more stable. But what should we do on a sport bike? So again, should right? This is all it's fairly subjective, right? We're talking. Uh, you know, everybody's going to ride and integrate with their motorcycle a little bit different. And if we're on a cruiser, right, especially if we're on a big, if we're on a bagger or a Harley or an Indian, like, we don't have like that connection with the, with the tank the way that we do on a sport bike or an adventure bike. But, um, a habit that I got into that turned out to be problematic was riding too far up on the tank, right? Um, so we talk about we talk about points of contact. So knees our butt on the seat, our feet on the pegs, and then our hands on the handlebars. And to, to, uh, what we want to do is we want to disperse our weight evenly between those points of contact, right? So that we're not putting too much weight on the bars, we're not putting too much weight on our feet, and we're not having too much weight on our butt, right? Which helps the motorcycle, again, do what the motorcycle wants to do. Underneath us, we need to disperse that weight. And when we start sliding up and down on the tank or forward and backwards on the tank, what we're doing is, you know, I weigh 180 pounds, right? And if we're talking about G-forces and keeping the chassis stable, not upsetting the motorcycle while we're riding it, so we're always smooth on the brakes and smooth on the gas. We pull the clutch in soft, we let it out soft, nothing is jerky, everything is done 
with purpose and done deliberately, if we're sliding back and forth on the bike, what's that doing for our chassis? So one big thing that I got a bad habit of was riding with a tank. Um, and when I received some instructions, um, uh, kind of a rule of thumb is a fist between you and your groin in the gas tank. And that's a good place. And then utilizing some you know, modern things that we have uh, added to motorcycle riding is tank grip. So whether it's tech spec or stomp grip or easy grip um, or duct tape for the garage, um, we can put some sort of material on our gas tank um, because I've experienced it. You know, you wash the bike, you detail it, get in there with some wax, make it all shiny when you go out and ride. It's like you're slipping and sliding all over the bike. And you're like, you should have done that right there on the tank. <laughs> if we could put some grip, some grippy stuff, help us to keep that contact on the tank and then keep that uh, space so that we're not sliding. Whenever we go to the brakes or we're not sliding up onto the tank, we go to the brakes, we're gripping the gas tank, we're maintaining that stability on the motorcycle. Um, uh, I like to have a little bit of separation. Uh, and I would say whether you like to ride up on the tank or not, or the kind of motorcycle that you're on where you're more locked in, um, like say like some of these old cafe racers, um, you're kind of locked into your position, all right? Um, but I would say pick, pick a spot that's comfortable, pick a spot that works for you and keep that spot. Because moving back and forth constantly is going to create, it's going to upset the chassis. Any questions? Well, you're fairly short, sit up front. <laughs> <laughs> Body physiology has a lot to do with it. You've got uh, you're taller and have high and you know, more uh, shoulder weight, so you can move back a little bit and still have your weight on the front end. Everyone's different, so you know you really have to figure out where that is, where you want the, the shoulder weight on the front end, because that's what makes the front end stick. That's why when you see a car or you, you decide to go fast somewhere, Red Rock. For me. I don't care if there's nine cops watching me, I'm dropping down like I'm on the racetrack because that's where the bike works. And if you put your weight in the right spot, like you're at the racetrack, the bike works. If you think you're, you don't want to do that because a cop might see you or somebody might think you're racing, now you're sitting up trying to go around some corner where the front end's not going to stick. You know what I mean? So it's a really weird situation. You don't want to look like you're racing, but you don't want to have the front end wash. I mean, you see what I mean? It's kind of a weird situation you have to just kind of figure out. So, don't yeah. speed, don't speed in Red Rock Chat. There's tourists. I never have. However, <laughs> <laughs> if you no, do should send me the deed. Check it out. Let us know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just another service we provided. Not <laughs> I uh, just remembered a good question. So uh, a little while ago, I was, I was taught yeah, this, um, that when you go into a corner, you're, and it's kind of like a follow-up question to the general what you're saying about the, the short pressure on the, on, the, on the bars. So they said when you go, when you go into a corner, you're supposed to uh, keep your thighs tight against the side of the gas tank. That's how you have the, those indentations. And you're supposed to keep your core strength, like your abdominal muscles, tight. And you're supposed to keep your arms light on the bars, but you want the bike to. They supposedly told me that the bike is supposed to do with the bars what it wants to do. So if you put too much weight or pressure on the front end, you're kind of like locking up the bars without the bike wanting to do what it naturally was designed to do. So that's not sure now. Hey, Will, at that at that point, can I say one thing? Left, I guess people that, that keep their their inside arms stiff. A lot of people do it. You go into a corner and you can't yeah, lean yeah. on your inside arm. Well, if you hit a bump, it'll just make the front end go away. You know, so I'm always telling myself, bend your elbow, bend your elbow. You know what I mean? I know it's going to help some people because I guarantee you, some of you are doing it. Go into a corner and lean on your inside arm. You know what I mean? And that's, that goofs things up, and that's what he's talking about. Doing that and we, for all of our motocross and dirt bike riders, too, right? Like when you go, I'm not very good at it, but like we're, we do it backwards on the dirt bike. We sit up off the other side and we push the bike down underneath us, right? Or on a sport bike, or even on, you know, I mean, I've, I've hustled the cruiser around with some good body position, we'll lean forward, bend the elbows, right? And uh, when I took the advanced rider training course from, uh, from NSF, my rider instructor, she said, make a move face. 
right? So we're going into a corner, it's like, it's really what it is to, re to relax our face and our jowls, which is a lot of times what we do is, <laughs> we want to relax, move it. <laughs> Silly. Silly, but I'm trying. <laughs> but relating specifically to your to your question, um, and I got a, I have a lot of riders that ask this. And, um, one thing that I, uh, watching my favorite racer, Valentino Rossi, uh, he's a long, lanky guy. And on corner entry, what you'll see, and you'll see this from a lot of MotoGP riders, in a still picture, right, at that like zero to 20, zero to 30%. So on the corner entry, as they lean the bike in, their arms are, almost, <coughs> they're not locked out, but their arms are straight. They are max performing that, that brake, max performing slowing that bike down and setting their speed. Their chest is up, acting as a wind sail, right, to get more performance because we can only brake up until 1G. So to combat that natural force that we don't want the rear end off the ground. Mark Marquez is a freak of nature, riding like that, and that's why he broke his arm a couple years ago. It's because... Hey, Honda boy, relax. It is. It is. <laughs> right? When, both when the rear end's off the ground, we can't max perform. But he has that. He has a feel that no rider has had in the last 20 years. He can, he can do that just because he can, right? So um, our arms, again, points of contact, right? So we have positive pressure on our foot pegs. We're gripping the tank. Absolutely, the core is engaged. And we have pressure on the palms of our hands, right? I was actually talking with my friend Jason uh, this morning about perfect, perfect for tonight. Um, we were talking about his lap time, and I was asking him about his brakes. But then we got into, well, how are you holding? How are you holding the bars? And if we're holding the bars with our fingers, we're grabbing here, right? Now our forearm is engaged. Usually our elbows are locked out. And now our arms can't act as a piece of suspension. Right? We want our arms to be able to move with the motorcycle. We're on the brakes. We're setting our speed or slowing the bike down, and we hit a bump. Right? If our arms are locked out, now we run into some problems. Either we're, you know, we're going to hurt ourselves or the bike. We're going to lose control of the motorcycle. So we want to, but we want to still have pressure, right? Because we can't, we can't let go of the bars. We can't not be turning the bike. So if we put, we, we stay in contact at that point with our hands here. And we're able to wiggle our fingers. So a little bit of a test if you're like, well, do I grip my handlebars too much? I don't feel like I do. I don't have rider fatigue. Can you ride around on the street with your hands draped over your clutch and your brake lever <coughs> and still turn the bike? If you can, it means that. Well, again, subjective, doing it right. However, it's maintaining a point of contact, right, without exhausting ourselves, without fatiguing our hands and our, and our fingers and our arms. If we get done riding on the street, we go for a two or three hour ride, we go up the mountain, we come back, and our arms and our shoulders are tired. It's not how it's supposed to be. We should be able to jump off and go for a run and have a good time on, I don't know, a 500 mile ride with a bus. Or, but my hands are not. We put, we steer the bike with the palms of our hands and keep our fingers loose. Um, and then obviously, same thing too, we're gripping the tank, we are engaging our core, if we're talking about more performance oriented or spirit, spirited riding. All right. But um, this idea that we, that we can't have any pressure on our bars, or we can't have, um, you know, we have to have our arms bent, and you can still. Uh, Distribute your weight, right, and have good points of contact on the motorcycle while still supporting yourself while you're on the bike and maintain the, the right kind of pressure on the bars. Um, it's something that I've been noticing more and more and more uh, from a performance point of view on the racetrack is, and I've been having this discussion with, with one of my guys, with Anthony, because um, he, he high-sided off of the front tire. So... Um, the front basically washed and then the bike flipped over and he went over the high side of the bike. Like a low side is when you, is when you crash and you just lay down next to the motorcycle and he goes away from us. The high side is when we go over the other side of the 
high side of the body. So he high sided off the front. And so we were having this discussion like, well, what kind of pressure are you putting on your bars mid point? And is it too much or is it not enough? Because sometimes the bike at mean angle, it doesn't take a lot to upset. But we still have traction, the contact patch is still there, right? But it's not as big as it usually is when we're straight up and down or we have max performance braking where it squishes underneath us and you know, not even, not even a big rock would upset it. It just track over the rock and roll over the rock. But when we're down there, max performing, any little thing could get in there and upset. It. And that's what it looked like. It looks like he hit a, a crack. And because he didn't have good positive pressure on the bars, the front end went like this. And so it, it started to get me thinking and it started conversations about how do we put pressure on the bars and maintain control of our motorcycle at 90 miles an hour, 80, 90% lean angle, right? Max performance. And the same can go for us on the street. You dial it back a little bit. Again, how am I engaging, being mindful? How do we engage the controls of the bike? How do we engage our points of contact, right? Am I, am I a little bit lazy? Am I sitting on the seat too much where I should kind of be, you know, maybe up on top of it a little bit more? Or, you know, do I let my, do I let my feet just dangle? And where do we put our feet, right? An athletic stance, a like coach always said in baseball, right? Like, be on the balls of your feet. Right. That's the same thing on a, on a motorcycle, especially on a sport bike. We get the most performance out of our feet when we're, pardon me, when we're on the balls of our feet, on the pegs. And so one of the biggest things that we see on a racetrack is riders riding with the peg on the arch of their foot. You can't, you can't exhibit force down on your pegs through the arch of your foot. There's no strength there. So, but when we put it here, now we can push down on the pegs and we can, we can put some force into the bike. And uh, that's, that's a more performance thing if we're riding, I know, excuse me. We're riding, you know, we're, we're riding to LA, you know, like as long as we have positive contact, right? With our, with our pegs, um, it's giving us control of the bike. But that's where we get the most control is on the balls of our feet. So spreading out our weight, disbursement, positive, Positive control in those contacts, but not letting not letting any one take the majority of the load. It's spreading it out between your feet, your thighs, your hands, your arms, and your shoulders. Is that, yeah. that's up. Yeah. One of these days, you guys are going to stump me, and I'm going to have to dig into the books to find the answer. Google. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to call. I'll have to call my coach. 